grace to you all this morning and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, here we are, a week after All Saints Day. We've got a week to practice our, our status as saints. How you doing? Good? You have a holy week? Were you able to live as God's saints this past week? As you look back and take a brief assessment of your week, um, were there those high moments where you were just, like, holy? <laughs> No, I'm not getting much back from you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really feeling a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of comfort with the questions that are coming your way. Uh, yeah, I guess I have to confess that I'm kind of in the same boat. As we all are, right? We, we do our best. We try. Sometimes we have that openness of spirit and heart and feel that peace that God gives to us. And we kind of lay our lives in God's hands and... And hopefully you've experienced that in your life and, and felt the power of that. But, but most of the time, it's, it's a bit of a struggle, isn't it? It's a bit of a struggle as the world kind of imposes itself on our spirits and, and pulls us in a different direction. And, and we allow that frustration that we feel to overcome us. And we allow that so sense of isolation and, and uh, anger sometimes to overwhelm us. And, and then we realize almost with a catch of the breath and and a shock that we've not lived as the kind of people that, that God has called us to be. And, and I, I am absolutely 100% grateful that we're gathered together this morning to acknowledge that. You know, what would be so easy for us as we fail to live up to the expectations and hopes that God has for us, what would be so easy for us would be to just turn away and, and give up, to not appear before God and worship together, to kind of say, look, I've tried this for how many years of my life, and, and I continue to not be the kind of person that I know God wants me to be, and so I'm not going to try anymore. And we know plenty of people who have done that, and yet, yet we come together, we gather together this morning. God has brought you here this morning to remind you that God continues to call you. And part of the, part of the success, if you will, of living as a saint, part of the success comes from getting this whole equation of what it means to lead a holy life the right way around. Which is really hard for us. We don't often do that. I'll, I'll tell you what I mean. As I prayed the prayer of the day this morning, I got a little uncomfortable because I know how it sometimes sounds to us. Um, we prayed, keep always in our mind the end of all things in the day of judgment. Keep always in our mind the end of all things in the day of judgment. And almost by our nature, by our human nature, our reaction to that is, is uh-oh, the day of judgment? Comfortable with that? Looking forward to the day of judgment where God exposes to you, and I don't know how this works exactly, I haven't been there yet, or, or maybe I have been in the waters of baptism, but I don't know how this works exactly. Does God sort of recite everything that you've done in your life? for everybody who might be there at the time, gathered together in heaven. I imagine the day of judgment to be one of shame and embarrassment and guilt. I'm not looking forward to it. So when the prayer says, keep always in our mind the end of all things in the day of judgment, immediately my reaction is to be uncomfortable. And then the very next phrase is, inspire us for a holy life here. And the way I put those two sort of pieces of information together is that if I can live a holy life here, if I can live a holy life here, I can avoid the shame and embarrassment of that day of judgment. And then being a good Puritan like I am growing up in this culture, I think, what do I have to do? I just have to try harder. I have to be more mindful of the things that I say and that I think and that I do so that I can, in fact, work on living that holy life here. So that I don't have to worry about the end of all things in the day of judgment. Now, whether you would express it that way or not, I know that you've all been there. Maybe you're there this morning as we begin to talk together about what these words from God mean. That attempt to try harder, to do better, to be good, to live the kind of life you know God wants you to do, 
to live, to be worthy of those things that God has called you to. And sometimes that works, right? Sometimes if you just try harder, you focus the message of our culture, you think positive thoughts, right? Then you'll be able to be that kind of person that God wants you to be. Sometimes it works for a little while. But isn't it amazing how quickly and easily those old habits creep back in? We kind of relax our guard, we let down our vigilance, and all of a sudden we find ourselves back in the same place. And maybe again with that sense of shock and awareness. So what happens next time? I have to try harder, even harder. I'll make this work. I'm going to work the plan. I'm going to be the kind of holy person God wants me to be. I'm going to be a saint. <laughs> that has never worked for very long in my life. Because so often when, when that's the message that we get, here's the message. The day of judgment is coming. We don't know when. But we must be prepared for it. Therefore, we must lead a holy life. Be saints. And I have to say, just as a bit of a, a, bit of a pause here, that Jesus' words to the Sadducees don't really help us that much. That one part, those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection. Those who are considered worthy. And the question is, will that be me? Have I done enough? How much is enough? This is the age-old human question. It's the one that saints and sinners have struggled with for years and years and years. And so we are no different from them. But what gets us out of that kind of trap of trying to feel like all we have to do is try harder and it will be better and then realizing that we fall short? And I hope we realize that. I hope you realize, as we said last week, that we are simultaneously saint and sinner. I suspect we do. So what keeps us from taking that title of saint and holding it up as a personal expectation of ourselves that in reality we cannot possibly meet? What keeps us from hearing that call to a holy life as something other than another obligation, only this one with even more dire consequences. What keeps us from that deadly realization that when we consider God's expectations of us, we can never and will never measure up. And what does that mean? <laughs> kind of want to become a Sadducee. The Sadducees were a religious party among the Jews at the time of Jesus who did not believe in the resurrection. And because of that, they were fairly typical. And so when they asked Jesus this question about marriage and whose wife will this woman be in heaven, they're really making fun of him. They're trying to catch him so that his belief in the resurrection is shown to be foolish and silly superstition. They think if their argument is sophisticated enough, he'll get all tongue-tied and won't be able to answer them. And then they'll prove their point by his inability to defend this position that he holds. And not only his point, but that of all those others who foolishly believe in the resurrection. It's like they're saying to Jesus and, and to those other believers, think about this life. Forget about the life to come. It doesn't exist. And what would that mean for us if we could just forget about the life to come and, and live this life? If we didn't have to worry about the day of judgment, the consequence of our actions, that ultimate call before God, what would that mean? I'm not sure I'm looking forward to that kind of a future, are you? Where there isn't that sense of accountability, finally, for our lives lived here and now before God and one another. But as much as we want to see that as an imposition on ourselves, 
certain sense of responsibility and obligation that we have to the extent that we see this call to a holy life as something that we have to somehow muster up the courage and energy for, I really feel that to the extent that we believe that we have to figure that out is the extent to which we will fail in our pursuit of it. This week I'll do something different, I say to myself. This week I'll get less aggravated at the other drivers on the road. I'll get less frustrated with people who are increasingly careless about the other people around them. I'll just try and understand, or I'll make excuses, explanations for them for why they do that. They too have busy lives. They're not doing it on purpose. As much as I say that to myself, it seems that it takes very little for me to revert immediately back to that old frustration and anger which helps me not at all, and for the other person to whom I project that anger, they could care less if they even know about it in the anonymity of our cars. But I want to try harder for my sake, and the harder I try, the more desperate and empty that sense of failure. Because I and we get it the wrong way around. We worry about how we're living our lives, maybe because we're concerned about what that future day of judgment might be like. Certainly that was a situation among the Christian congregation in Thessalonica, to which Paul writes, some people were saying that the day of judgment had already come. And there was panic almost in the midst of those Christians there, whom Paul loved so dearly. And they were worried about how they should behave now and what that meant and had it passed and had they missed it or, or was the judgment already there and they were okay and, and, and what should they do now? And Paul says, don't be anxious about that. Don't be anxious about that. Really? Really, don't be anxious about that day of judgment? Don't be anxious about that moment when we come face to face with God. Why not? Paul says, because you've been called for a higher purpose. I love that. You've been called for a higher purpose. Higher than what? Higher than this focus that we sometimes have on our own behavior and the behavior of people around us. You know, the Sadducees end up, as they have this conversation with, Je with Jesus, just looking silly themselves. Coming up with this bizarre scenario about a woman who gets married to a man and he dies before they have children together. And so the obligation of that day was that his brother would marry her. And then if she was blessed enough to have a child, it would be considered the child of the first brother. It was an obligation that was practiced so that she would not be left abandoned. And so they come up with this crazy situation where seven brothers marry this woman and they all die. And she's still childless. But she was married to every one of them. And then in heaven... They try and take what they know about their earthly existence and project it into heaven rather than letting heaven, the kingdom of God, inform their earthly existence here. Paul says, don't worry about day of judgment and, and how God sees you and what that will mean for you. The kingdom is already here, he says to them, and you've been called for a higher purpose then all that anxiety that other people seek to stir up in you and make you fearful of, you've been called for a higher purpose. Paul mentions three things in particular to which we as followers of Jesus have been called. Which, because God calls us to them, are already now present realities in our lives. Let me run that by you again, okay? Paul mentions three things to which we have been called as followers of Jesus. And because we are followers of Jesus, those three things are already reality in our lives, already, if we care to look at them. Okay, so what are the three things? Paul says you've been called for salvation. 
a reality, sanctification, and glory. That's pretty cool. Right? Paul says you've been called into salvation, sanctification, and glory. That's your higher purpose. Those are the things that God is already now, even as we gather together this morning, working in your lives. Salvation. How will I be saved? Will God want to save somebody like me? With all my failings and frailties and mistakes and sins, will God want to save me? Jesus tells us it's an accomplished fact. What does it take to be worthy of that place? Jesus has covered that for us. We have been called to salvation, which is already accomplished, not as a future hope, but as a present reality. To see yourself as one who God has gathered together in God's divine hands through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. You've been called to live out the reality of that salvation in your life. I remember when I was in college, obviously it was a vivid experience, not college as a whole. Um, but this one encounter that I had on, a num on numerous occasions with some of my classmates who were born-again Christians. And their question was always coming around to, are you saved? Are you saved? Are you saved? And it always sounded to me and to so many others like a challenge. Like the right answer was, I don't know. Maybe not. What do I have to do? And at that time, this was in the um, late 70s, the kind of phrase that characterized the born again Christian movement was, I found it. Which always struck me as a little bit of a weird phrase. And that was it. I found it. It was on t-shirts. It was on bumper stickers. And what that found, what that it was, was this relationship with Jesus that gave them a sense of, of peace and hope. I found it. Well, I thank God that I was raised in the Lutheran church and learned a few things along the way because something about that phrase bothered me and the challenge that I got from my classmates about was I saved really kind of struck me as being the wrong question. And I had a t-shirt made up. And on the front of the t-shirt it said, I never lost it. <laughs> <laughs> and on the back of the t-shirt it said, life in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> because it wasn't me that needed to find it, it was God that needed to find me, and God did that in Christ. I knew I was saved. Not because of my own behavior on any particular day, or the inclination of my heart and mind, but because God decided that I was worthy of the sacrifice of His Son. And that was a reality that fully filled me up in baptism, that whether I paid attention to or not, never changed. God's promise is that God holds us in the palm of God's hand. And even when we don't feel like we're there, it doesn't change that reality. You have been called for the purposes of salvation. And then Paul says you've been called for sanctification. Which simply means a greater realization of the reality of the first. Sanctification. Holiness. Never something that we do. God, God says to God's people, you shall be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Holiness is not my creation, not my frame of mind, not my doing the right thing. Holiness is because I've been touched by God who is holy, and therefore we are holy. We gather together this morning as God's holy people to hear the word and share the food, to strengthen one another in our walk, to realize that God has made us holy because that's who God is, and that's what God wants. And so it's a present reality in our lives. Holiness is an awareness such as the Sadducees did not have. That this resurrection belief is not for someday in the future, but for here and now. That God lays God's hand on you. 
that you belong to God. That you are holy because of the one who owns you and loves you. So we've been called for salvation. We've been called for sanctification to realize more and more that salvation and live from the power that it can bring into our lives. Not as we screw up our intention and our courage and our determination to live that more, but ironically, as we relax more into that reality of who we are and therefore are infused with grace. And finally, Paul says you've been called, and I love this best of all, you've been called for glory. You've been called for glory. Is your life glorious? Maybe some days, maybe at those high moments, maybe on the mountaintops. But maybe not most times. Because we will always struggle as we walk this journey of faith in this broken world with, with the reality of that which is not right, which is not holy, which is not of God. And we can't ever forget that existing right alongside that reality, which is temporary, which passes away, is the reality of God's eternal presence. The reality of how God sees you. And if you remember nothing else from today, please remember this. When God sees you, God sees glory. When God sees you, God sees glory because God creates things, people, life that is glorious. And sanctification, too, is realizing that God has made us to be glorious, holy, saintly people, even as we struggle to embrace that reality in our own lives. And so we are called for a great purpose. We are called to be saved, sanctified, and glorious. A reality that we grow into that God already sees. Don't fear the day of judgment. We know that someone has taken the responsibility and the punishment for that upon himself, Jesus on the cross. Don't fear. You are God's holy people. And when God sees you, God sees glory. Amen.